the community, as you know, they, they don't really listen to what you tell them to do. They have their own ideas. Yeah. They want to, so they started working on things. I thought, what? That's not important. Why don't you work on that? You know what they did? They fixed the modeler. Because they wanted to model, they wanted to use the software for creating <laughs> things. And they were right. Of course that's important, right? And that's what, what you got if you got communities involved. I think Blender is in a pretty exciting place right now. Because I don't know if you know this, but 10 years ago, Blender's reputation wasn't so great. But today, it serves as a very real competitor to the big three. And there's signs of this. RenderMan now officially supports Blender. TurboSquid and Evermotion now offer Blender models. AMD has added their support with OpenCL. And while most large studios still haven't adopted Blender officially, it's becoming increasingly popular among the smaller studios as they no longer see the value in paying thousands of dollars for software that Blender can essentially do for free. And what's more, the big 2.8 update is just around the corner, promising a complete UI overhaul, real-time rendering, workspaces, collections, asset management, dependency graphs, all things that I personally think are gonna push Blender into a very real professional category. In this video, I spoke with Ton Rusendahl, that crazy Dutchman who founded Blender. In the interview, we talk about how Blender almost didn't happen, what's holding Blender back, the Autodesk conspiracy, mm -hmm, spicy, predictions for 2.8, as well as, of course, a healthy dose of UI debate. It's a long chat, but I've included chapter marks in the description so that you can jump ahead to whatever interests you. And before we start, this video is thanks to the support of Polygon. To create better renders, you need better textures. So join Polygon today and experience the difference that a sharp, professional texture can make. And now, on to the interview. So Ton, it's, uh, I've been wanting to interview you for like six, seven years. You did? Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. At the Blender conference. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. And who would have thought it would happen in LA, a place where neither of us are from. <laughs> but we got the cameras here, Tom's here, why not? All the important people are in Los Angeles, uh, that's why we made, we are. So they, the so they say, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to know, because I haven't, I know very little, but what, what, what is your background? What, have you always been interested in programming? No, I, I, I studied industrial design. It's, uh, you know, uh, to make products, product development. Uh, I actually wanted to be an architect. Okay. But I met some guy in a bar one night when I was, uh, wanted to pick a study, and he said, oh, industrial design is so cool because it's and creative and technical, right? And I liked those, uh, I already liked that, to do something creative and technical. Uh -huh. So I decided to start a company to uh, have uh, money to buy more expensive and bigger computers mm -hmm. and to work full time as a computer graphics designer and uh, to do animation, especially 3D. How old were you then? And that was uh, when I was 29. Okay. It was, uh, that was Neo Geo. And that name, we were first. The, the game console was also called Neo Geo. It didn't exist then, so we had that name. And it means uh. ne Neo Shape. Geo is a uh, for, form. So oh, okay. Geo. Yeah. New, new shape. Ah, fun, right? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's form for, uh, uh, it's uh, Greek, I think, not Latin. Uh. Anyway, we want to be cool, huh? Yeah. We had a nice name, and we started a studio in Eindhoven. Uh, I did it together with a business partner. Uh, we got some employees, and suddenly we had like seven people working for us doing computer graphics. So that's where Blender started in that environment. Hmm. So I was doing the client, and I was doing uh, the art direction, and I was also writing software. Hmm. And I thought, at first I didn't. I thought, come on, I my business partner, he wrote software. I said, come on, we are not a software company, we are a design company. So what are you doing all day programming? But he, it was fun, and I could see that. I thought, okay, let me try a little bit. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah. I mean, coding is a really fun. You ever tried coding? 
No. Come on, HTML pages. Like AI, oh, I have no, that no. kind of stuff. Like, that's all very fun. I right? did it in school, yeah, yeah. yeah? Visual you, Basic as well. A little bit JavaScript or Python. No, nothing. No, no, no. Visual Basic. Yeah, Visual uh, Basic. HTML. I did that in school. Yeah. yeah. So it stuck really with me. I really like it because you you can really focus on that for for days and weeks, <laughs> and then you can make something that works. Uh -huh. I thought the first thing you try is a ray tracer. And you have uh, some mathematics and lines, and you bounds, and you have normals and some basic mm. high school mathematics, and you can call it a ray tracer. Yeah. And then you say, oh, that's cool. But now how do you add a text here? Well, you have to add some weird formulas and see what happens and how that looks. And then you try to try make it faster and optimizing it. And, and then you want to have a modeler, of course. So you try to look at how does that work and how do you make that interaction work. And then slow by, slowly, I think it started already in 85 on the Amiga, I did some development. But the real work started more like in 91. Yeah. When we bought our first big computer, the Silicon Graphics, and it was in those days the brand for 3D computers, because you had a graphics card that could do real-time wireframes and solids. <laughs> real-time. And the Amiga, you had to render a wireframe. So you didn't even know what it would look like? It was like. not real-time wireframes. It was line, 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 line. You had to wait five seconds and you had a wireframe. Wow. So what you had real-time was bounding boxes. That's why Blender still has bounding boxes for it as a broad type. Mm. And it started in those days. That was the only interactive mode you had with bound boxes. And then you had to press enter and then <laughs> you saw the wireframes. Huh. But for sure you would not have any solid rendering at that time. But in 91, we bought a Silicon Graphics. It costed the equivalent of $60,000 for one computer. You bought from Silicon yeah. Graphics yeah. $60,000? All our profits, everything we made, we put in one computer. Wait, wait hang on. How, how long, you, when did you start Neo Geo? In 89. So after two years, uh, we were running, okay, but it was all with Amigas. Yeah. And then we, all the money we made, we bought one computer. Wow. And we didn't have money for the software. So that was, uh, of course, uh, Alias was available, I think Softimage and a couple of others. But Alias would cost you another 60,000. So yeah, that was 94, 95 Blender was more or less functional, but we could do the first projects with it. And at that time, the software was totally designed to work for the projects we do. And then I made all kinds of design decisions that you can still see nowadays in Blender. And some of them were very fortunate and really good. Mm -hmm. Give me a, what's an example? For example, uh, I used a subdivision interface. In those days, every program would open in 20, 30 different windows, and you had to lay out all of that uh. yourself. And then everything you would do, it would pop up something, and you have to fill in uh, the stack to say OK, and then it would apply it, right? And there was a blocking interface which was overlapping. And I thought we should not do that, we should have a flat interface which you subdivide and you assign functions, an editor type, to a subdivision thing. And if you want to have two editors next to each other, you should be able to do that. Or you have two windows, you can have that too. But it's basically one window from start with a subdivision, and you make a layout, the screen, and then you can swap those layouts in and out and have uh, your editors configured. Where did you get that idea from? You get that idea by uh, thinking and analyzing. So right? you didn't read any user design books? Or Jeez, I don't remember. Hmm. I mean, uh, I think it, I was inspired by web browsers in those oh, days. Oh, web browsers. Yeah, the first web browser started. Yeah. And the internet, internet pages, did not have the possibility to open windows. Right. Uh, maybe now you know, the people hate that anyway, because yeah. you have a web, yeah. and you don't want the web to pop up things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they try to design uh, web pages that were flat, and they had columns and tabs and stuff, or frames, they call right. them, to, to, to work. And it was very efficient. Yeah. I have to go back to my story of uh, the Blender. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so 1999 we're up we to. We had uh, uh, 95, 96, we had uh, the first Blender version. I, in 98, I sold the company. You sold the company? Uh, not for much money, but... Uh, 
Neo was, Geo, the yeah, company. Okay. I, I, I could take the software and I say, okay, because the, the whole industry was went down. Really? Because there was not a lot of money anymore for all this uh, visualization stuff and for video programs. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody wanted to have either games or internet. What? The internet came up. You have to go to the internet and interactive media and uh, everything. Mm. Oh, pff, boring, right? Who wants to do internet stuff? <laughs> Everybody is doing internet stuff. I want to do something nobody is doing. For right. example, yeah. making a 3D tool. So I, I decided to start a new company to have Blender there, put it on the web, I make a, a website, get uh, a forums and see what happens if I give away the software. And that was 98, and I remember the first version uh, was published. First, only the Silicon Graphics uh -huh. version. And then within a few months, I had a Linux version, FreeBSD. And then I got an, uh, an employee, my first, and he helped make uh, the Windows version uh -huh. for Blender. And that happened uh, within one year. Where did that idea of giving it away for free come from? Open source. And the first a year of the Northern Ember company, that is the company I founded to market Blender. We didn't uh, have options. Blender was free, but it was not fully free. So there were some features locked. And I sold keys, had the B key and the C key. And if for 50 or 100 dollars, you got to get a key and that would unlock more stuff in Blender. Ah. That was uh, how I got my first money in, also to get to SIGGRAPH and present Blender. But then I got investors on board uh, the, in the internet bubble. Uh, I was there with, with two people in a little office in a startup center. And there were people coming in. Oh my God, your company is worth 10 million. Huh? Right, 10 million, sure. But uh, you have to be very strong uh, to resist that opportunity. Yeah. Because they said, right, Tom, you can get five million investment money, and then we'll make you really big. We hire 50 people, employees, and uh, you, can, uh, you can become a billionaire in whatever. So you have to try if you get that opportunity. It was fun. So yeah, I got an investor on board. Uh, at first, four and a half million, or later, one million more. To, uh, and then we really? Had, Wait, you, know, you got a million dollars of investing? Half a million? Four and, and a half. Four and a half? Total, in total, five and a half million. What? Money, real money. You what know. happened to it? Where did that... All that money, <laughs> with a burn it. <laughs> it was a big fire. What do you call it? A vanity, bonfire. Okay. <laughs> Well, okay, you watch uh, the TV series Silicon Valley. Yes. Ah, that's my favorite. But it's actually true. It happens like that. It's actually true. How many people did you hire at the most? 50. 50 people. So I was with two, and like a few months later, we had 50. That's crazy. That was crazy. So you really just burnt all the money. <laughs> yeah, or, uh, I remember we had a big booth at SIGGRAPH, and we went to the Game Developers Conference, and business meetings in, in uh, the Bay Area, of course, flying business class, going to uh, Japan, and everything. <laughs> really? yeah, it was, it was not a bad time. And they, they were investing so that you would make the software huge and make them more yeah. money. So the, the, the business model was to keep the software for free, okay. to give it away, and then make professional services around it. Mm. And well, we had fantastic stuff. We had a 3D web plugin, a 3D on the web. So you could save a blend file, and you, could, you had a plugin working in the browser, and then that blend file would load, or the plugin would load the blend file, and you would see your stuff. Really? Including complete games. The whole game engine was running on the web as a web plugin. Wow. Wow. Well, the first ten, sketch ten, 15 years too early. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So that was, uh, it was fantastic. It was good. Very new. But how do you make money with that? Right? Yeah. You can only do this if you get like five years uh, that you can develop. You have to develop the market. And um, you can start growing uh, a customer base and try to find out where the real money is. But then we didn't. Huh? As I said, the internet bubble bursted. And the investors said we had uh, to, they wanted an exit within nine months. Hmm. So the investors 
called me in, said, Tom, we're going to stop this. And we're going to put your blender in a drawer here and lock it up. And you can better do something else. But this costed us so much money. And, um, and at, at that time, of course, <laughs> I had nothing left. So in the beginning, I owned 100% of blender. And I ended up with 10% still. So you had to buy back Blender, essentially? Basically. Right. But that took a while to convince them. And that was the famous uh, free Blender campaign that happened in 2002 in the summer, when within seven weeks we got 110,000 euros and dollars, which is some um, amount, collected via the community. So you asked That was the when I negotiated with the uh, investors. I said, well, let's be fair. Blender is not worth anything at the moment. It's 2002, there's a crisis, nobody invests anymore. Nobody would buy this software without me because it's a totally ununderstandable piece of shit with Dutch comments in the code and stuff. <laughs> so without me, it's not worth a lot. So okay. here's a proposal. I will do a campaign online to collect money from the users and I will get you 100,000 euros as a license to make Blender open source. So you keep the rights, but you uh, give it away as open source, or you publish it as open source. Under the most strict license, eh, the GNU GPL is considered to be a very extreme license that only allows software to stay free. And you cannot mm. use the Blender code in a commercial product unless you make that commercial product open. And so that's why Blender is always free. It has to be free forever. That's in the license. That's how this system works. So if you own the rights of a piece of software which is uh, licensed as GNU GPL, like Blender, you can still have the same copyright and put it yourself in a commercial product. And you can sell that. That's mm. how the license works. And that's how someone is able to <laughs> sell Blender on the uh, eBay or whatever? Yeah, they can. Legally, they yeah. Can. They can right. do whatever, but for as long as you give them the software. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, so in seven weeks' time, we had the money, and that was amazing. What uh, year? What year is this? 2002. Okay. Yeah. You were not using Blender, though. You were still in, uh, in high school or so doing things. I started using it 2003. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, a couple of years Sorry, later. Uh, was one year later. Yeah. But it was amazing. And it's, uh, it is unofficially, the, I think, the first crowdfunding ever. Is it really? Yeah. Because it's, uh, it had, we had perks and we had uh, things. Did you really? Thought, yeah. You had perks? <laughs> even people could uh, make a, a promise. They said, well, you have to sign that you pay a certain amount of money. But if you get the goal, then you have to, uh, to cash. Ah. Look at that, mm, early Kickstarter. Uh, you, you were ahead of, ahead of the times. Six, five years. I'm always ahead of the time. <laughs> you try to do something because nobody does it, right? That's fun. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I suddenly had an uh, open source project. So I had to read up about open source, how that works and stuff. And, uh, but originally, I thought it would not work. Uh, that open source thing is not, uh, I don't know. But it was mainly for me, as a, a little monument to have Blender online and the software for the users so that they can always keep using it. And also for everybody who worked on it and the developer team in the company, that they can take that software and show it to uh, the, the other companies or use it further. So it was more like a symbolic wrap, more than a, uh, a new future. And within a year, I found out that it was actually working. And making Blender open was totally the best thing I, I could ever do. Yeah. But suddenly, you got a whole interesting community dynamic going on, right? And the community, as you know, they, they don't really listen to what you tell them to do. They have their own ideas. Yeah. They want to, so they started working on things. I thought, what? That's not important. Why don't you work on that? Like this fantastic web plugin and all the uh, stuff, 3D on the web. Imagine. And nobody was interested. You know what they did? They fixed the modeler. 
because they wanted to model, they want to use the software to create <laughs> things. <laughs> and they were right. Of course, that's important, right? And that's what, what you get if you get communities involved. Uh, they're not always wrong. I mean, a lot of people actually do really, really good stuff. And they, they do what they think is important. It's what is in their interest. Yeah. More than what they think, I have a dream, I have a vision of how the internet will look like in 10 years. <laughs> not interested, right? right? Things should work today or tomorrow, or I want to have it now. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to invest in something that takes 10 years. And certainly not in open source. Right? They always like very short term little things to move on. But then you can see, okay, I can help with that. You only need one little thing, like to fix tool tips or some lander. Okay, I can handle that. Mm -hmm. right? And that's how you, you grow the community and that's how the, the developers got on board. Could I ask, at that time when you made it open source, did you did you ever imagine that it would be this many years later with <laughs> no. as big as it is? T totally not. Totally not. What did you think was going to happen? I, at first I thought nothing would happen, but uh, it would be there and it would slowly fade away. Really? Like, it was fun for people that they could still use it. Many programs died. Yeah. If you look at it in the past, a lot of projects they have some interest in from people and then they all move on and they go somewhere else. I think it didn't happen for Blender for a couple of reasons. Of course, one is uh, there were no competitors, right? Ooh, there was nobody having a functional 3D creation tool in open source. Mm. Also, there's no open source competition. No, there was no, in the open source world, there was right. no competition. So, and also not a renderer, yeah, okay, there were some renderers. But the production, it was production ready, right? You could do cool stuff with it. It had some hair, it had some this, it had a video editor, textures. There was you know, a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, character animation. You could do things in Blender. Mm. And that was uh, a complete creation package. Yeah, as it is now, but it was then too. So with one program, you could start it up, and then you end up with a finished product. Yeah, like something, a film, or a clip, or a presentation, or a visualization, or a little game. But everything is possible to do in one program. Mm -hmm. And that makes Blender special too. Because people can put their whole life in it, right? In the morning they fire it up, and then they make things. And it's just with one program. And that's special, I mean, with GIMP or with Inkscape or uh, Photoshop or uh, OpenOffice. So you don't have that very special relationship with a piece of software. Mm. And so that, that made Blender special. And of course, Blender was not that bad, right? It had a couple of good concepts behind it. And a couple of really good developers with uh, smart brains got on board mm -hmm. and they said, oh, that's fun, well, let's see what happens. And then there's community dynamic and of course everybody was really proud that they got the money together. But there was all lots of good vibe to, uh, to make something happen. But uh, the first year I hardly didn't do anything for it. I only set up the foundation and the website and make sure that everybody could work. Because I really wanted to see what are people going to do, what is the, 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 the focus of what will they pick up, or how does it work, I have to learn it. Hmm. And then later on I picked up uh, programming again, and especially maintaining the Mac version hmm. on, uh, for Blender. I had no idea that Blender had such a corporate beginning. Like you were five, had five million dollars, 50 people. That sounds like the start of like, a, like a, an Autodesk story or something. Yeah. How did you go from pursuing the money to then suddenly going like, f everything is free. What was, did, did something change in your... No, no but I, I, I was never interested in money. Money doesn't mean anything. It's not interesting. Mm -hmm. I call myself a maker. I want to make stuff. Yeah. Uh, whether that's software or 3D or designs or building teams or companies. Or, I want to make stuff. I, I, that's my passion. And the money is a means. And sometimes you need it to do something big. So you have to work, make money, and then you can do something with it. But the real satisfaction is in making something. Uh, that's uh, making Blender, I'm uh, making the foundation, making books, I'm uh, making the 
kleinere DVD's. En later aan making the films. En mm -hmm. doen een software business, dat was een optie. I mean, after the bankruptcy, we, we also looked at, oké, okay, maybe we can make blend a commercial and then do it very cheap, like for 50 dollars or so, and uh, with two or three developers and continue it as a small company. Uh, but that's simply something I didn't like. Mm. Right. It would be too uninteresting. And then you had to sell software. It's boring. Right? <laughs> On the internet it gets a bit easier and with the app store and stuff you have ways to, to monetize things. But in those days, uh, or, or the way how Cinema 4D and other uh, programs have to sell software, it's uh, half of your money and overhead goes to the sales department mm. or more. You have to set up a typical business that's very sales driven and then you only have a few clients and you make it for them. And the only relationship we really have with them is that they pay you and then you give them something back for it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like something I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not my maker thing. How many people work for the, the foundation at the moment? Well, the, the, the foundation doesn't have employees. Okay. So the, there's the institute. Oh, okay, sorry. The so the institute, how many yeah. people does the institute So the, the foundation, have? to be clear, the foundation is the, uh, the public benefit. That's the, mm -hmm. the, the safe. And it's a real foundation. And the foundation should only be used to make sure that there's always continuity. For all the copyright is there, uh, the ownership of Blender.org, the, uh, the website URLs, uh, the registrations, a lot of copyright on the Blender software is in the foundation. And the foundation has a non-commercial, non-profit goal, public benefit, so whatever is there is meant to help the goal, keep Blender free and help people to use Blender. Mm. The Institute is something I started in 2007, uh, after the first open movie. Okay. And that movie business is uh, what I brought back after five years of open source development, because I thought it was all going a little bit into a very nerdy, technical, typical open source world, uh, where the programmers are telling everybody uh, what they have to do. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people hate open source projects so much. Mm -hmm. And they all say, yeah, the most bad, sucky interface uh, uh, ever, and they don't listen to users, and they're only interested in their own beautiful, nice code. And I didn't want that. I, I like to work with artists. I, I'm a creative person myself. I don't think beautiful code or fantastic, uh, well-designed software is interesting. What I'm interested in is working software. If it works, right, then we have something good. And if something beneath there is ugly and horrible, then okay, you should fix that one day, but it works, right? Mm. Way more important than things that are beautiful, but they don't work. Mm. There's so many people say, look at my code, it's the most beautiful code ever, and then nobody uses it. Why, why, why is nobody using my fantastically beautiful code? Well, maybe because it's not usable, right? Or not interesting for users to have. Right. So that's, uh, that's the thing I wanted to bring back, and that's why we I started the Blender Institute at the studio there to make frequently films, or even a game, to get artists on board to work together with the developers to always make sure that whatever we do, there's always a user breathing down your neck <laughs> telling you, yeah, that's nice, but I would like uh, uh, to have working hair, and I want to have uh, combing tools, and I want to have uh, better rendering, I want to have global illumination, and I want to have what? So the, the, right. the things you actively need for production. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. not the things you need because uh, the community votes for it. So Elephant Stream was 2006? Yeah. And then that's when you made the Institute. Um, and what was that? Big Buck Bunny? 2007 uh, and 8. And then with the Shintel. Yeah, and every film had their own technical targets. Yeah. Uh, Elephant's Dream, uh, the whole animation system was we done. And we had our first compositor built in Blender, mm. 2005 and six. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. And the node systems, we could do materials and stuff. 
What? Yeah. Nou, dat moet zelf, voor Big Bang Bunny het was mostly een karakter animatie voor de improvements voor die formatie. En hair, fur, combing, grass, all that kind of stuff. High quality rendering, as well, so better anti-aliasing. Uh, voor Sintel, die ja, dit de 2.5 project. Uh, dat, uh, to get rid of a lot of shitty old interface code. And, uh, when in what, in what year? Uh, for Sintel in 2010, and oh, right. it was 2.5, yeah. when we uh, did a lot of work on uh, the interface. Uh, making, mm. you remember that? That's I remember that. Project. Yeah. So that was a big leap. Yes. That was a big leap. It was. People thought uh, at first, uh, Blender was, was really weird, yeah. and then suddenly it became less weird. Huh? Yeah. It was like, oh, I recognize some of those things. And they were, um, it was a little bit more accessible, but better structured. Yeah. And especially we, we added a way, I don't know, what I'm mostly proud of uh, in 2.4, if you would slide a value for a button, you had to release it to see an effect. And what? You had to release the button, and then you, 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 see, you saw an update. Oh, right. For everything you did in the interface, every widget, every tool, every button you did, it was not live updated. Right. You had to you do it and then you had to update. And had to update. And suddenly things were all parallel. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. So I remember the first time I used it was like the particle system. So it was running these particles down and then I increased the number of particles and they go... <laughs> Wow. And I was like, whoa, wow, the thing is running. Yeah. Right. And you can rotate it and move it around and it's like shooting everywhere. Uh, yeah, it was, like a, it was like a game. But that's not easy to do. Right? That is a, a, a very, uh, I call it a very uh, uh, system that has to be very well balanced. Every little component has to fit. And if one thing doesn't work, then everything works right. or crashes. Right. Ja, yeah, so during Sintel we uh, made 2.5 workable. Right? There was, uh, was like almost every line of the core Blender code had to be uh, rewritten for this. Yeah. In the whole core there was, uh, I forgot, a million lines or something. They all had to be done, one by one. Everything was thrown away and recoded. And that was big. And I could do that thanks to, of course at that time we had more donations, I got some subsidies. Uh, the e-shop was doing really well, uh, we could sell DVDs. And, uh, uh, we, we sold in the end almost 6,000 DVDs with uh, Sintel on it, uh, the data files. Really? Yeah, and every DVD was 34 euros. It's quite a lot of money. That's nice, you can do stuff with that. Yeah. So that helped us uh, getting uh, everything fixed and done. We could hire developers, and it was Brecht, of course, Brecht van Bommel. And we had Campbell, um, basically with the three of us, we were the core of the 2.5 team and loads of great volunteers mm. around it to make it possible. Yeah. Uh, and then we did, uh, of course, Tears of Steel, was motion capture, uh, sorry, uh, motion tracking, uh, masking, uh, the whole visual effect pipeline, and the first project we used Cycles for. Uh, cycles. Oh, right, of course, yeah, cycles yeah. Cycles popped up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. yeah, that was great. What, what about Yo Frankie? The well, sorry, I missed that game that was in between. Uh, yeah. It was a bit, uh, before Sintel. Uh, right. But Yo Frankie, I, I usually forget it a bit because it was not a complete success. Uh, that, okay. uh, it had mixed things a bit. Because I thought as an experiment, uh, I was too optimistic, but I thought let's do something, an open project with another community, another open source community. So they do the game managing and then we oh, do Oh, Crystal Space? It was Crystal Space. Yeah. yeah, and it didn't work? Nah, it didn't work. Yeah. I, mean, I was really spoiled with the quality of how the Blender community, how they, at that time they were already very professional, high quality artists, good developers. And you can really say, sit together and say, okay guys, we are going to, huh, what are we going to do? And we already did that a couple of times uh, for two movies. Mm -hmm. And I thought that uh, for the game project, you could simply set a nice target and a big leap forward. And simply by doing it, uh, by announcing it and putting some money in it and making awesome content, it will happen. That's the magic of open movies. Yeah. But for Crystal Space, that didn't work. So. Can I ask, a lot of people wonder why the, the game engine part of Blender hasn't 
had a lot of uh, attention on it. Uh, because halfway the, the, the Jo Frankie, we, we switched from using Crystal Space to using the Leonard Graham engine. And it was mainly thanks to one developer, was a guy from Belgium, Pinois. And he suddenly started fixing every day, like everything. Right. And later I heard that uh, he's a daddy and he had his uh, little kid playing with Blender and he wanted to make a game in Blender. Okay, sure, let's see. Yeah, it's a bug. I'm going to fix that. Ah, another bug. So he was simply working with his son, fixing Blender to have his kid able to make a game. And meanwhile, we were working and struggling with this game project. And we thought, oh, the Blender game engine is way too unstable. Nobody can fix that. So we have to use Crystal Space. Uh, and suddenly uh, he started fixing everything. Oh, I didn't know this. It That's was so good. But those kind of things are hard to organize. Yeah. So how do you find what he is? He's a, a top software engineer. He's hired by big companies and stuff. I, I can't even afford him that. He's really good. He's working for medical simulations and uh, that kind of things. He's good. He's still on board. He's doing sometimes things, but he's, he's fantastic. Yeah. And he made it work. But then uh, he had to do other stuff, and then we were stuck a little bit again. Yeah. Right? So yeah, why the game engine? I think the the game engine's main problem is that the original design from uh, 2000. Uh, in the Northern Number Company, we redesigned the game engine. There a whole lot of design decisions were wrong. They were not good. So we had all kinds of assumptions about how to put it in Blunder. Uh, most of them didn't work out. They didn't work out in a way that you would get a natural uh, evolution of increasing quality in the software. Mm -hmm. And with Blunder, a lot of those design decisions were very lucky. They were good. And, they, and, and if they were bad, you could fix it. But then you had an evolution, as you know, for Blender, where Blender kept improving and improving and improving. And it's like crazy. It's amazing how much improvement we could afford with a piece of software from 95. Right? Gosh, yeah. So that's uh, the, the, the good thing of Blender. And the Blender game engine, it's a pen and it's mostly uh, one of the, the worst thing that the game engine didn't do well was that it completely duplicated the code. Right? So if any feature we add in Blender, you also have to do that again in the game engine. So you got two code bases for the same right. feature. Not everything, but for a lot. Yeah. Like for example, even now you added EV in Blender, it's not in the game engine. You have to duplicate it again. So and that's not, it sounds simple, but it's not, because adding software is only stable if you keep working on it and looking at it, and there's hundreds of people online working on the bug tracker, reporting things, and really make that work. And so the amount of feedback people give on the Blender code, and the, the Blender usability, is way higher than the amount of feedback and energy that goes to the game engine. And the game engine, every time, they have to find time to copy the fixes and the code over. Right? So all the energy that went to Blender doesn't go to the game engine. Yeah. So if we would have designed a structure where, well, let's say, 90% of the game engine would be using the same code as Blender, then the game engine would have benefited from all the work on Blender itself. And the maintenance of the game engine was much smaller. And that's my proposal for a new design for the 2.8 game engine, is to... Yeah, tell me about the plan. Yeah, re we have to reuse much more. And, and I know it's not fun. I, uh, the most game engine coders, you know game engine coders? There's a special type of people who do that. It's like render engine coders or ray tracer coders. Because you have something, and it's a piece of abstract stuff, as a code thing, and you can completely control it. It's exciting, it's fun, right? Yeah. And then you can make it faster, or you can make it, uh, you add some features, and it's a nice thing you can hold in your hand, as I do here. And you don't have to do a lot with other people. Really, even better, right? So it's great stuff for, for the, the computer coders, the nerds, who don't like people a lot. They want to have technology to play with.
Mm. And Blender is not like that. Blender is dirt and messy and complicated and lots of other people are doing things. Yeah? He's doing something and then something falls over. So that's the, uh, a different approach. So uh, that's a... Uh, um, so this game engine idea for 2.8 is to make sure that uh, most of it will become part of the Blender project. So, for example, we have EV, and EV suddenly, yeah, pff, everybody's making fantastic things with it. Animation is coming back in EV this week or next week. Animation? Animation, of course. Animation playback, real-time characters, all the oh, stuff. Oh, that isn't in there yet? It's not yet, but now it's coming. All the modifiers, uh, subdivision surfaces. It's going to be a very high-quality production engine. And it's real-time. <laughs> so having that know, in yeah. the game engine, or that would make things so easy for users. So you start modeling, you press uh, P for the game engine, and everything is the same, and it's real time. You animate something, and you can do the same animation. <laughs> so it should be fluid. Basically. Yeah, yeah, but maybe you don't make it P. <laughs> the uh, number of times I hit a, that. A foot pedal, a foot yeah, pedal. Yeah, yes, oh, yes. No, I, I hit the P key. Or maybe Control shift alt c Yeah, of <laughs> course, <or> five <laughs> buttons, or waving at your screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gestures. What's the plan with, uh, what's the, plan with the interface <clears throat> for 2.8? Because there was a time a few years ago where I proposed a plan for a crazy interface. Wasn't that great of an idea? Yeah. But uh, I got a lot of people thinking. Um, what? So what? Yeah. What's happening with the? Yeah, what happened interface? with your fantastic design? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened with it? <laughs> I mean, in the, the recycling bin. The design was not bad. Uh -huh. I mean, that's what we agreed on. It was not uh, that you did something stupid. But the, the thing was mostly to keep it practical. You know, what we have Blender, and how do you get Blender to become better? How do you improve it? And that's a different task, a different design task than as, uh, making a new design for it. It was difficult to apply that. You say, OK, here's a design, and I'll let science Blender to make it work for it. Right, yeah. So it should be more the opposite, because here you have Blender, and what is a better way to use it? So how can we improve it that we, it becomes easier to learn, or better configurable, and all those other things? Right. And for 2.5, we tackled a couple of topics, yeah. but we left a lot. And that's why uh, I decided let's do a 2.8, which has similar ambition, really big things, and make sure the Blender is ready for the next decade. Mm, decade? Uh, oh. Yeah, of course. Oh. It's almost 2020. I know, right? It goes really fast. Yeah, Blender's got to keep with the times. <laughs> yeah. So you have to, because 2.5, 2, the whole uh, design process and everything was started 10 years ago almost. Gosh. And then we were finished in 2010. So mm. now, uh, last, last year, we started at uh, 2.8, and that will be 2018, right? Yeah, so the it's going to be finished at the start of 2018? <laughs> yeah, I hope. I hope. If everything works. If you out. had to put money on it, what day would it yeah, release? With the more, uh, I think the, the planning is to get a beta version uh, in March, April. Okay. Something. Right, right. Good work. So maybe and June. Have, uh, <laughs> and by the, and um, by the end of our, our at the conference, uh, Blender in October next year, we could have the first official release. Ooh. Or maybe at Seagraph in Vancouver. And, uh, mm. But I want to hurry up. People have to be, it also means to be practical. We can't do everything. Huh? So we have to depend on, on really good people who know how to code things. Anyway, so what is wrong with the Blender interface? But there's a, a couple of, of things. Huh? A lot of people, uh, first, uh, you don't have to like every UI. I mean, people have their own preferences and all the way of working. Or sometimes they are used to work with a specific tool. And they like Blender to do the same. The other problem is that what we tried with the UI was to make one configuration work for everyone. You tried? Yeah, we, everybody yeah, in the yeah. community tried. And that's your P key problem, right? Uh. You hit it all the time. It's stupid, right? And at some moment we added um, for the animators that the up arrow would not advance 10 frames anymore, but it would go to the next keyframe. 
Ja. Hey, dat was, dat was juist toe. Quickly, yeah. with that arrow to go the steps of ten through, through my animation. So they did change it. I and thought I something happened. And I control happen. up. Nou, dat was dus de, de, de developers die zeiden, waar I'm not deciding everything. But, so, you, you get different types of users and they have different types of interaction. Uh, they have different uh, shortcuts or tools they think are more important. So we decided to, instead of having one configuration for everyone, we should allow Blender to be configured for different types of workflow. An animator they is not so interested in having the game engine, uh, the motion tracker, uh, all the stuff. You can remove easily half of the shortcuts, which is not interesting for animation. All the stuff that is uh, useful maybe for modeling or for uh, physics and particle systems, all that stuff, or modifiers. Animators can configure the software for them to be fast with all the arrow keys and the clicks doing exactly what they want. For a modeler, or a sculptor, or a 3D painter, or a video editor, or a motion tracker, you can basically have it the same. And they say, okay, I'm motion tracking this shot or this film. I have to work for two or three weeks only on motion tracking. I want my tool to help me to do my work faster and more efficient and, and less mouse strain or whatever, right? so that I can uh, configure that. Mm. So that's meant for the, uh, the power users, huh? that's the hardcore users. But what I added to that was, so let's also then try to make a configuration for more occasional users. Huh? Not everybody is working on 3D professionally, but there are a lot of people who say, yeah, but sometimes I want to do something in 3D. I want to make a 3D print, or I have a 3D scan, I want to retopo it and print it out or I want to have a little model for an AR application, because 3D is now mainstream. Right? Uh, 3D is part of your education nowadays. Everybody should understand it a bit. You think? Yeah, yeah. it's coming. In, in Canada, uh, high school kids have to do a 3D classes. Really? Yeah. They have to? Yeah. Mandatory? Part of their uh, uh, curriculum. Autodesk won a bit. Oh. We try to get Blender in the high schools, but Autodesk won. The story of Blender. Uh, no, <laughs> you don't have enough money to bribe the right people, I think. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you think of Autodesk? What do I think of Autodesk? Yeah, yeah, because I know they are you... my best friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I I uh, I usually try to meet Autodesk people in the SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles or elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. But this year I was too busy and didn't have time. But last year I had a couple of meetings. So you meet sorry you meet Autodesk people at SIGGRAPH. How does it go? Do they ever go like you said on Twitter? Ah, oh, they're going to sue you. <laughs> they no, they're nice. So once I had uh, the last year I, I saw the. Uh, the, the head of uh, Arnold, uh, they were bought by Autodesk. Okay. And uh, talking to them about things because they wanted to get Arnold also in Blender. Uh, how do we work with that, problems, licenses, stuff like that. And I had a meeting with uh, guys about FBX, because FBX mm. uh, is the, the, the standard, right, for a lot of artists to move uh, animation data from one application to the other, especially in the games industry, as everybody is using FPX. But it's a locked in format. And Autodesk is frustrating everybody who tries to reverse engineer it by changing the format every year. That's for fun. Wait, who is? Autodesk. They are? It's a strategy, yeah. Oh. They simply obscure things and they make things to make sure that everybody who has their own FBX thing, for writer, reader, every year we ha you have to update things and uh, fix it. Oh, no. No, that's not fun, right? What did you tell them? Yeah, I told them that. I said, yeah, yeah, man, that's technical reasons for that, blah, blah, blah. They don't really admit this. Financial But I said, yeah, but you have to but what would be better if you say we are going to do something for open source or for our users, then make sure that interoperability between Autodesk products and other products, that, that is smoother. If the industry works together, that's a win-win situation. And they, they listened and they said they would come back to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't really push this. Mm -hmm. But I've never heard back. And I think internally Autodesk is of course uh, they have their own policy. It's a two billion dollar company. Is it two billion? Two billion every year, revenues. So they are worth Whoa. 
down, I say, I don't know. It's not a small business. That's huge. Yeah, it's big. And they are on the stock market, so yeah. they're publicly traded. So they are not so um, uh, um, easy. I, uh, I'm myself, I can decide every day what I want to do. But they, they have a job, and they have a boss, and then a vice president, and then a senior vice president, and then a director, and right? so that's how big companies go. So those mm. things are not so simple. Right. Well, but further, Autodesk is of course a, uh, a company with a, I think with a philosophy that they want to lock in the users of their own world. And so whatever is possible with 3D, Autodesk should give them the full package. And if they don't have something, they buy it. They what? They buy it. Oh. Right? No, not, uh, but, uh, most of the tools, uh, from Maya to 3D Max to Arnold to uh, Flame, remember it, they all bought. They didn't make it. They buy them. Hmm. And then they stamp it with Autodesk. And that's how they can create an infrastructure where everything is happy and beautiful and everything works together, but not if you use one of the competitor yeah. tools. Of course, that's how capitalism works, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't uh, you can complain about that. Yeah. But I don't blame them. It's, uh, Who, who's making the Open Olympic sim system? Olympic, uh, I think it's ILM or ah. I think it's ILM, ILM. And they also did Open EXR, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So they're more into the open. Oh yeah, the film industry is totally into it. Yeah. But they, 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 they must hate this FBX every year thing. Uh, but they never, they, they use my eyes, so they don't have a problem with that. Oh. Uh, so we hate it, especially. Yeah, I bet. So. Can you make it reverse? Like, can you make a FBX? That does proprietary work with Blender? Does that is that uh, legally? What some people wanted us to do is to get the FBX library from uh, Autodesk and put that in Blender. That's the official way how all other applications do it as well. And then you get the Autodesk code and you link it with Blender, and then we have FBX in and out. But the Autodesk license doesn't allow that to combine it with open source. Or for some people, it's the other way around. The Blender license doesn't allow to use the FBX library. They're completely different worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you if we would do that, then we are, we're not allowed to bundle it. But then if you start Blender, then you have to go to the Autodesk website and register there and then download that component. Or we have to do that on our website and give Autodesk all the information from every user who downloads a Blender. Hmm. That's in their license. Really? So any program who has an, an agreement with Autodesk to use FBX is following that guideline. They give all the privacy and all the personal information to Autodesk. Oh, and that's why you wrote that, that post. Yeah. Nobody reads those licenses. And Nobody. this one is quite bad, isn't it? It's horrible. Yeah, it's uh, not. They can visit you at home if you use Autodesk <laughs> and check your computer was on it. That's but a good uh, quote. Uh, some, some, <laughs> uh, some, some people ask me, hey, Tom, if I use Blender, is the art I make, can I, oh, is that my property? Can I do whatever uh, okay. I like with it? Of course, that's <laughs> open the free software foundation uh, philosophy, right? We are making free software. Do whatever you do with the content. Autodesk, on the other hand, they also have uh, the educational versions. In the license, <coughs> it says that everything you make with educational software is not your property. You cannot do whatever you like with it. It is restricted. You can only do a little bit with it, but you cannot do other things with it. So basically, Autodesk controls the content for that. Oh. Especially for commercial use or use inside of companies or if you want to sell something. So you can only use it to learn the software, but not to do anything with the content. And that's... And, that's, and then they complain about Blender having an evil license. But of course, everybody ignores... Wait, who says that? Uh, who says that? I get that kind of emails. It gets less, but 
even uh, today a business meeting with the studio. And they say, yeah, yeah, we are thinking about Blender, but the license, you know. And then uh, if we start using Blender, then we might get sued or there are patent problems. By who? And is the content ours if we use Blender? Is it really ours? Because we got free software? Maybe the content is then yours. I said, no. <laughs> I do hear rumors that Autodesk is spreading that story. What? Yeah. <gasps> yeah Autodesk. That's a conspiracy, people, They Tom. go to companies and say, ah, I don't use Blender, but you know, open source, uh, they, the content you make is, has to be open too, so you have to share it or everything. They spread those rumors. Yes. So shame on you. <laughs> on the desk. That's, <laughs> well, allegedly, or not even allegedly, rumored. We should say. Yes, I yes. heard. You heard from... I heard it. But I heard it from people <laughs> who heard it from Autodesk. Okay. So, it's only <laughs> one in between, right? It's, it's, an effort, it's, it's a witness, right? It's like, you, you could tell me, and then it's... I have to believe you, right? Yes, yes. So, yeah, I met, especially studios uh, in Europe, but also Australia or, or Indonesia, they get visitors from Autodesk. Oh. And if they say, ah, oh, we are using Blender, then especially they get visitors from Autodesk. Knock, knock. Hey, I'm your Autodesk uh, sales representative. I see you're using Blender. I have something much better. Let's talk. Maybe we can give you nice discounts or things so to make sure that you are kicking Blender out. Whoa, that this really sounds very... Happens. Really? Yeah. Sounds very 1984. It's, it's normal business. Why is that nasty? They make money with it, it's what they have to do. I don't make money with it, so I don't care. If they want to use Maya, they should use Maya. Yeah. Right? So you, you believe that the product, should, the product should speak for itself, right? Like if it's better, you use the better one. Yeah. yeah. Everybody should, should decide that for themselves. Mm. I think that's a bit of a difference between the Blender, how Blender is in the open source world. Uh, some people, use open source software out of principle. Huh? GIMP or Inkscape and uh, or open source video editors. And they want to live in an open world. They use Linux and they only use the open drivers. And they make sure that the whole system only uses open source. Mm -hmm. And for, for them, Blender is of course fantastic because then they have an open tool to do things. But that might be I don't know, 1% of the users, maybe? There's a tiny fraction of the people use Blender out of principle. Most people use Blender because it's fun, or because mm -hmm. they like it, or because it's a fun community, or because of the freedom, yeah, you can have it legally, you don't have to worry about uh, evil corporations uh, mm. uh, visiting you, or, yeah. or simply because it's good enough for them. Yeah. They like it. Mm. I mean, you know that. Of course. What, why do people come to the Blender Guru site to buy stuff? Because they want to have fun, or they're interested to develop skills, or they want to know how to make real grass. And then they model a city from the house, right? But, and then with one button, they can make it look awesome. Yeah. Right? And that's fun. Yeah. And that's, that's stuff people like. It's yeah. playing with 3D, learning from it, and next time you make a better house, or you got a training how to make good architecture, how to make the light for that, and, and people like to develop those kind of skills. Yeah. And I think Blender is more than good enough for that. Mm -hmm. Don't, uh, that's not the same level as Maya or Max. Mm -hmm. Right. Or even better, I don't think Maya or Max would ever make that possible, like what you do. You know what's funny? I, uh, very early on, I, I was, after I started Blender Guru, I thought, maybe Blender's not the, the best for the future. Like, I don't know, it seems like 3D's Max could be, could be bigger. Yeah, so what I did was I, uh, I emailed um, Autodesk and I said, hey, I uh, just want to check, legally, am I able to uh, have a tutorial website I'll call it 3D's Max Guru, whatever. And I make tutorials about your software. And uh, they couldn't give a straight answer. They had, they didn't know, 
<laughs> they said, well, we would have to get back to you. We have to check with the legal team kind of thing. And I thought, forget what? it. Forget Pretty it. Max Guru, a shower would not be approved. Um. Yeah, I know. So it's like they don't want tutorials for their... I don't know. Maybe it was just the person I, mean, I spoke because, with. Yeah, but it's a locked-in system. Yeah. So there are, there are not many uh, Max users, legal ones, or legal Maya users. That's true. Uh, most of them are or they have the, the, the student version, or they have the yeah. free version. I know. And that's, uh, that's a bit of a problem. That's why what I said. So uh, thanks to Blender, you can do this, and the cookies and others, they can do things. Because the uh, users can get the software, they can get it for free. Uh, it's an interesting uh, product, it's not an evil corporation behind it, and then they build a relationship with you. Because you do something, you add value to the product, and that's what people like. And that's what people like. Other uh, people who make Blender products as well. Yeah. And if you would do this for Maya, then you would, you would get a completely different thing, because the first step for them is you have to buy Maya, or you have to buy Modo, or you have to buy uh, any other product. And that's a big investment. It right? is, yeah. It's really, why would they pay 3000 per year for the software, and then have for fun, right? Yeah. Or for a training yourself, or doing something. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a huge amount. I was thinking that, like, I, I didn't realize how much more expensive it is, like, I use Adobe Creative Cloud, the subscription, and it's $600 per year. But you get Premiere, Photoshop, After Effects, Audition, oh. InDesign, you get like 20 pieces of software, $600 a year. And then we were looking at for Polygon, oh. like purchasing 3ds Max so we could make tutorials, it's three grand. And then you want to do one for Maya, another 3,000 per year. And I was like, <laughs> blows my mind. I don't know how they get away with that. That's crazy. It doesn't make any sense to me. No. Well, it's because they don't sell that many. Yeah? You think it's still quite niche? I mean, the, the 3D market is small. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you could look it up. I, I, did, I wrote that. Remember you said you saw that on the, on the wiki? So I, I went to the public report from Autodesk and look at, okay, uh, what, how much money do they make? Okay, two billion per year. And then you, you get more information and you see, okay, the, the whole of the media, uh, the digital media department of Autodesk, that's where Mudbox, um, Arno, Maya, 3D Max, and all those tools are, it has $100 million revenues per year. Now, 100 million, that sounds fantastic, but it's all of them. Yeah, that's not no. a lot, is it? Imagine half of that is uh, uh, 3D Max, that's 50 million. Max costs three, 4,000 per year. Now, you divide that, uh, 50 million divided by 4,000. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's 10, calculator. 10, 12,000 licenses. Is it? What? Ten? Who's calculating it? 12,500. Yeah. That's quite... That's nothing. So they have that's an alarming... Things, yeah, so sure. Maybe it's 25,000 or 30,000. You get more downloads th than that in a month, right? Blender gets more downloads than that in a month. Yeah, so but, okay, most of the, the, the probably is a million downloads every year or so for Max or for Maya at the Autodesk website, at the folder right. training and uh, uh, the student versions. But the paying user base is not it's that different. big. Yeah, yeah. And with that amount of money, they can't have a lot of people developing. So uh, there's maybe 10, 20 Maya developers. And they have a, a group in, uh, in China now, in the Chinese factory. Wait, there's only 10 or 20 developers? Hmm? There's only 20 developers? No, 10 or 20 something. For, for 3ds Max or Maya? For Maya. Max is bigger, but Maya is not that big. I would have thought there'd be like hundreds. And that's how do they pay them? There's not that much money for it. It's like a hundred million dollars. But Maya is maybe one tenth of the size of 3D Max. Is it? Or maybe Whoa. 20 percent. Come on, how big is it? I don't know. You have 100 million, you have to divide it, right? Yeah. There's all stuff going to Mudbox, there's stuff going to the compositing software, and the stuff, huh? So what is 10 percent is Maya? 20 percent? It's nothing. It's not a lot, is it? You can get Whoa. 20 people or so, or 30 people. And of course you have to pay all the 
sales people, and the marketing people, and the key in the lock installers. And you have to pay the resellers. Uh, people should resell the software, they get a percentage. And then you have very expensive boots that say Grav. Uh, and you add up all those things. So, and then there's a little bit left for the developers. Where did you get that 100 million figure from? Where is that from? You can find it online. Yeah? yeah. I tried to find it, I couldn't find anything. So, <laughs> you have to find better, man. I know, maybe I was typing in users, and I couldn't find actual user no, statistics. No, no, of course not. You have to, you, what you have to ask for is annual report or the desk. Right, financial annual reports, report. yeah. And that's the official report they have to deposit because they are public traded companies. Shareholders, yeah. And every right. public traded company has to publish the numbers. And then you start digging, yeah, it's, it's boring, it's uh, yeah. whatever, yeah, 100 pages of stuff. And then you see some numbers, it's like, aha, yeah. uh, uh, media uh, and uh, the media and entertainment division, that's what it's called officially, it's 5% of the revenue of all of Autodesk. So it's like, oh, that's, that's the number they said. So, okay, let's see, the total is 2 billion times 5%. Yeah. One hundred million. <laughs> uh, what did you do in high school? I did not do a lot. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I, I'm, good, I'm good in the, in the numbers. As a coder, you have to be able to do sure. your yeah. brain. So, no, yeah. That's the one thing I like about Blender, you can do the math in yeah, the... Yeah, exactly. Or I type it in Google, 150 yes. times 20. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do that. No. <laughs> anyway, so that's how you start. And I yes. say, okay, so that's 100 million, that's the size of the media. An entertainment group. Now, what can I find more? So, how much this and that, how many, and I uh, say, so, well, that's not a lot of money. Most of the money they are making with, not with AutoCAD even, most of the money they make with visualization. Visualization. What, what do you mean? The, the, the car industry, uh, uh, architecture companies. So there's a the whole there's a lot of technical visualization going on in the world, and it's very specialist. Oil industry, uh, you know, industry, right? Yeah. It's tough. I mean, I mean, the happy uh, 3D art and uh, and games world where only smiling people walk around, but there's a whole world of factories and companies, yeah. and there are engineers sitting behind workstations and doing boring things, like mm. floor plans and things, and pipes. Uh, that's how you build a house, or a car, or what. And that industry is way, way bigger than the whole film industry and the games industry together. Is it? Of course. I would have never guessed that. I thought they... What I do you think? How do you make a car? I haven't <laughs> looked at it. <laughs> I think you, you spend yeah, but I don't know how many way more money on making a car than making a movie. Really? <laughs> Otherwise, if, if watching a movie only is ten dollars, buying a car will cost you fifty thousand. Oh, but that's a good point. I was thinking right. profit. And you know, know how many people have a car? It's a lot. <laughs> well, how do you make them? It's a good question. Uh, and, and they all cost twenty, thirty thousand each. Yeah. Try to do the math. Yeah. Those companies are way bigger. Well, when you say it like that. But, uh, but I, I, I was just thinking, like, the movie industry, they say it's like one of the most profitable industries, right? Because of how... Nah. Like, the, like every, even the duds, the movies that, that do terribly critically, they still, you know, making 80 million profit or whatever, it's not unusual. So I thought, it's huge. That's why Disney buys everything. Uh, Disney bought Pixar, they bought Lucas, they bought... Wait, 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 uh, Disney didn't buy Pixar, did they? Yeah. Disney bought Pixar. Aren't they in a... a, a yeah, it was... It's an agreement, uh, isn't it? It's a partnership. It way bigger than Pixar. Way. They have so much. Oh, I they know if Disney's TV bigger. and parks and... Uh, of course, yeah, yeah. But so. I don't know if they bought Pixar. I don't yeah, think that's true. they bought Pixar. Is it? If you go to a Pixar movie, you get first the Disney logo. Yeah, but it was a... A merger, you thought. Uh, it's an agreement. No. Didn't you read that Disney Creativity Inc. Inc. book? Ask Google. <laughs> Disney bought Pixar? Question mark. Google it. And it uh, will tell you. See, the problem is we put this out there and then the information is wrong. Then 100% of the comments are, Andrew, you're wrong. 
pick size owned by Disney. So we have to yeah, we have to figure this out right. before. I'll always ask Google first. Yeah, I know. Soon we'll just so. be Echo in the corner. I got it. Okay. Acquisition by Disney. Disney announced on January 24, 2006 that it agreed to buy Pixar for approximately $7.4 billion in an all-out stock deal. Following Pixar shareholder approval, the acquisition was completed May 5, 2006 from the Pixar wiki. If we trust that. I do not oh, I do know who made the most money with that. Ed Steve Catmine? Jobs. What? Steve oh, Jobs Steve from Jobs. Apple. Yeah, that's he made true. all the money, but yeah. he, he owned most of Pixar. Yeah. And well, where's he, that money now? He fronted the money, of course. Uh, what do you mean? Where's what? the money? Somewhere here in LA, there's the daughter of uh, or the kids of Steve. Yeah. Or whatever the Bay Area. And they have uh, 10, 20, whatever billion on the bank. Yeah. Mm. That's the sort of thing that makes you think like late at night and you're like, there's people out there with billions. Where are they right now? Flying around. Getting depressed. Yeah. <laughs> Eating no, hundred million dollar sushi. There is no the normal person you can talk to. If you know, if you're walking around, ah, I have 10 billion on the bank, and then you think, oh my God, you can make everything possible. You yeah. can go to Mars, or you can make your own car yeah. company, or buy everything you want. Yeah. After a while, that shit is deadly boring. Yeah. And then nobody talks to you in a normal way. Yeah, uh, that's, that's true. I have heard, and then like... you have to lock yourself up and talk only with other billionaires. Yeah. Oh, how fun is that? <laughs> I've heard like no, you shouldn't ever want to be a billionaire because what you can do with a billion dollars is almost the same thing you can do with 10 million. But when you're a billionaire, the amount of attention you get is makes your life unbearable. So it's better to be a lot smaller, you know. Not that it's a possibility for me, but <laughs> uh, still thinking about uh, it. Still thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, this doesn't pay for itself. Uh, you know what, uh, I'm saying? Uh, uh, uh. what do you think is? Uh, what do you think stopping Blender from becoming the predominant software in the industry? Like, you, sh you could be able to walk down to Disney or another studio and everybody there is using Blender. How come they're not? Yeah, but what is the dominant software? I mean... 3D's uh, Max or Maya. Uh, but not if you walk into Disney. They don't use Max. Well, they have their own thing, they yeah. Use, yeah. They have their own things. So the smaller, the smaller ones, the smaller studios at 20 to 50 people, that size, right? And if they are VFX, yeah, so it's of course all Nuke. Nuke is fantastic for things. But for modeling and for 3D, Blender, you can see more often popping up already. In, in small VFX studios. Companies, yeah. But I don't think it's something that stops. I think it's a gradual evolution because the it happens now, little bit by little bit, more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there is a whole VFX studio in, uh, in LA only using Blender for that 3D stuff. Barnstorm, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm visiting them on Friday. It should yeah. be fun. It's, it's really fun. Yeah. And it's, it's insane. You see people using Blender and they're not complaining or so. Also. They don't make a problem. They just click around and do their stuff. Yeah. It's a job. Yeah. And they do awesome things. Good artists. Good software. I know. Yeah, good, uh, good product. Is it just me? It feels like Blender very recently, the last two or three years, has reached like, I don't know, the graph of like adoption seems to be going like exponentially <clears throat> more. Like back in 2009, it was like very fringe group. Like if you mentioned to somebody that you use Blender and they're a 3D artist, a lot of people hadn't even heard of it. Whereas oh, now, if you say Blender, like... But after 2.5 and Sintel, that was the first leap. I th yeah, that, that was that, a leap. Uh, that suddenly it was amateur, uh, fun, hobby. Yeah. And suddenly, hey, this might be uh, possible in production. Right? Yeah. And for me, another big, big milestone was as uh, Sigraph 2013 or 14, when uh, Pixar announced to support Blender with Renderman. So ah. they have the Renderman plugin, and they only do that for three or four, four programs. So they have Renderman for Maya, Renderman for Houdini, Renderman for I forgot Max and Blender. No, no Max. Really? No way. 
Houdini, yeah, that's where Maya, I've, Blender, and I forgot something. That's where I've noticed it is when you go to the um, third parties in the industry and you visit their website. Like in the old days, if you look at like software supported, Blender was never on there. But now, it's, it's there. And it's quite, I'm like, ooh, like Evermotion, they started releasing some model packs now for Blender. And it's like, it's quite, um, but that's, things are changing. But is that a purpose strategy, uh, in a sense, right? I, I think the best thing of uh, what we do at OpenSource is to keep it very feasible, simple, and stable. So we don't do risky stuff. If you would be a company, I don't know that you run a business. You suddenly have employees and people working, and then you suddenly look at your monthly uh, expense and say, oh my god, shit, uh, every month tens of thousands or 50,000 is going out. How am I going to pay everybody? I have to keep the company running and stuff. No, but that happens for cinema or, or the others. They have to make 10, 20 million per year. Right. That means every month they have to pay one million in costs only. Every month! Yeah, it's so quite... What happens if, the, if the, suddenly they have like 100 less users or so, or 200, and so, oh my God, with the fire people, and they, look at that whole stress. So a lot of the focus on the business is not so much on the product development. And in Blender, I always try to have all of the focus on the product software. Uh, the users, uh, the bug fixing, keeping it stable, make sure that things are working, make sure that we are not uh, going into 20 different directions, finding the right people to help contributing, and setting a very gradable path, and make sure that every step is always supported and feasible. Uh, that's, and that's, you can only do it if you do it more slow. Mm. And otherwise things uh, would break. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, you do a leap. Uh, that's what 2.5, we did a leap. And officially, in open source circles, doing those kind of leaps are always failures. So no open source project is advised to ever do a leap. Always do things quite well. Really? Yeah. So but that Blender survived one leap. Uh, it was unique. It's really unique. Is it going to survive the next leap? We will find out next year. <laughs> yes. I think so. The 2.8 is going fantastic. I think so. It's going fantastic. And Eevee then and you saw it on Sigwaf. Oh, you were not there, but Sigwaf, you had EV. Yeah. And uh, EV is, is, is like, for my, like, oh my God, it's really it's not only real time, it's Blender the Shelf, it's the tool. You click on things, you move things around, you press tap, it's edit mode, it's this. You can paint on it, you can move the lights around. It looks photorealistic and it's real time. What? Finally. It's so good. And then we didn't even start. There's so many other really good features coming in 2.8. Uh, the what, like uh, the dependency graph, multi-threaded, uh, duplication, uh, massive stuff. Uh, way more complicated scenes that stay interactive. Um, multiple times in windows. There's one window playing Blender in animation. The other, you can post the character and you can see real-time updates. Mm. That kind of stuff. And of course, the 101, eh, what I said, we're going to make a version of Blender which is reduced. And we can remove 95% of the features and really try to configure your things with nice, simple, big buttons. And then make, for example, the first prototype we want to make a tool for people who use 3D printers. So you want to have a model, oh, I want to clean it a little bit, I want to see the size, and then you send it to the printer for print. I'm quite skeptical of, of 1.1 because the, I, I heard an analogy. I mean, tell me what you think about this. But they say, like, uh, you shouldn't ever uh, simplify the software if the plan is to get them to use the original. Um, because, like, if you want to teach someone how to drive a car, you don't first of all give them a car with just a steering wheel and no pedals. Because then in the future, they're going to be struggling with all the, the different things. Kids. I, I've seen those toys with all the steering wheels. <laughs> so and that's why it's so difficult to use paddles down there. Uh, maybe the analogy is not really the best, but, but I know what you mean. Huh? The, hmm. uh, how can you uh, de-complexify something in a useful way without yeah. taking away what, uh, the, what it makes powerful? 
But I think uh, for Blender, we can do it now, because if you look back huh, from 2002 all the way 15 years later, the amount of stuff we added to Blender is insane. From Even though it looks very great with all the market and stuff, but the amount of features and things Blender can do is really, really insane. It's getting out of control. Mm -hmm. So even when we want, we can't continue that way. There is no space in the UI, there is no space uh, for the shortcuts. We can't handle it. Mm -hmm. We have to do something to reduce it, to specialize. That's what I said. Because as a sculptor, a modeler, you want to have advanced tools, but you don't need to see all the other stuff from the game people and the motion tracking people and the, the lighting and texturing people. Mm -hmm. right? So you can reduce from that 100%, you can go back to 30 or 20 okay. and then optimize that. But every feature that you have left is still advanced. So it's not that you make it less good uh, to sculpt. Of course not. Sculpting stays fantastic. But you don't have all the other stuff on the way. And so for 3D printing, it, it can still be, I mean, you can have sculpting in it for 3D print. It's very nice to sculpt on uh, to do for 3D printing. And you can base, and the model can be there. And uh, that's it. And you make a nice bigger toolbar with bigger icons, so you have people can find the basic tools better. Mm. So that's what you can do in, uh, in 101 or in 2.8. You can configure your UI entirely. Mm. And you can make a version with only 10 materials, 10 models, and then you drag a model in the window where you see a monkey, and then you add the blue material on top of it and you have a blue monkey. And further, Blender wouldn't do anything. That's possible. That's much my challenge for the coders. Is that useful? No, I don't know. But I want to try, right? Mm. Because that's that did you read it, we have what we call the application template. It's a new concept in Blender. It's a template that also becomes an application. So there's a Blend file that has the configuration of Blender. And then if you load that, you can get a complete different software, mm -hmm. almost. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. I want to see how that works. And it's an experiment. You only know... Uh, That's right, I agree. You have to do it to fail, right? Yeah. That'll be a success. You know what would be another cool experiment? if we made the left mouse click the default. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's already uh, discussed a year ago. Uh, and that whole well, can you tell thing. me what was the, uh, what was well, the uh, outcome? The whole thing for how do you want to configure a blender is going to uh, get an overhaul. So if you start blender for the first time, you can get a very quick little Questionnaire, that's what the button that says, well, I want to, I'm a power user, I want to use the previous settings, click, you got the old settings, or say I'm a new user, and I want to learn Blender, and I want to have the settings, one or two options, and that's how you can uh, start. And for the new users, you should follow all the conventions, that's fine. But if you say, no, I want to learn the tutorials from Blender.org, uh, oh. well, then you can get a that's gonna make my That's going to make my job quite hard. But in principle, <laughs> you could make your own application template Yeah. on the, your website and say, here, download Blender, but get my template, and then Blender becomes your Blender. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, I went to the ZBrush Summit, and they were saying, like, because uh, I tried learning ZBrush a little while ago, and it, it blew my mind just how poorly the interface was, and it's like it's it it's looks so fun and stuff. The screenshots are lovely stuff. But oh yeah, fun, it's but it's very it it works just like real clay. Things. It works just like real clay, but it's it's more complex than it needs to be. And uh, everyone I spoke to at ZBrushes, they say yeah, but the default one is very tricky. But once you learn it for five to ten years, you can make your After custom yeah custom interface. And I said. Ten years. That's, That's the problem with ZBrush is that they haven't got a good default software. I think I think the software I, I a default but is the, important. The, there is an interface team, and I said before you are welcome uh, to John. Uh, Jonathan is there, and a couple of others. 
and they will make sure that uh, we have a number of defaults. You cannot only have one because everybody is using computers in a different way. And for example, with pen and tablet, uh, uh, you don't have a left or a right mouse, you only have a click and a hold click. And for them, uh, you should be able to have within one click of you start to start Blender to make Blender working for that. And that is similar to how you want to use Blender only with left click. Because people only want to use left clicks and now right clicks, or they're not for selecting. Uh, you should have that configuration work from start and very well designed. But that doesn't mean that the concept of assigning selecting to a different mouse button is not bad mm -hmm. or good. Mm -hmm. I think it's really good. Yeah. And it, it saves you from mouse strain, especially if you use a little bit more fingers. Yeah. If you only use one, I can't use this on I have to switch mouse to left. Yeah, now. but it's the convention. Yeah. It's what yeah. everybody knows. Yeah, you know. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for new users, left mouse select is uh, very more convenient. Yeah. 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 And I think the main the main problem is not so much the default. The main problem is that uh, people don't know how to find the default. And there is that the left click is still not as good as the right click. Because not everything works optimal if you configure it. And that's what we have to solve. Yeah. I think it could be it could be solved more easier than it sounds though. Like I remember Sebastian made a video explaining why the right click was better and superior was totally superior. <laughs> totally. But everything that he mentioned could be solved just by holding down control. You know? Like, it doesn't have to be right or left. It's like, make it left, but if you want to select that other thing, it's, it's control left. I don't know, I feel like it's not, it's uh, not. And for the, we have tablets nowadays, and tab pads, and uh, mm. for those things, we have to look at well, where does it go to, or how long I will keep using my mouse. Yeah. You use a tablet yourself? Yeah. Sometimes? Yeah. With Blender? No. Oh, oh for Sometimes. sculpting, yeah. Ah. Okay, but uh, I think the tablets are very nice interfaces, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to make work. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, of course we work on it. Yeah. So I'm allowed to contribute to the interface. Then. Of course. I thought I was expelled from the discussion. Make mockups, come with designs, ideas, yeah. uh, see what other people are doing. Yeah. Of course. There's a lot of politics in interface, isn't it? <laughs> nah. No. <laughs> Nah, it's, it's uh, okay. What is part of it? I mean, the politics part is uh, that you should collaborate and look at this, what, what other people are doing and not trying to push one thing as the truth. If you start having discussions on that level, so as people say, yeah, but everybody or the market standard is, and that's why we. That's, that's always confusing discussions, because you will never agree on those things. So what you can better look at is, okay, so how can we create the optimal workflow for Blender users? So how does it work? What are the things to make sure that the experience is optimal, that you can work fast, and that you have a good ergonomic workflow? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, those kind of discussions are more useful. If you agree on that level, then you can say, okay, we have a nice design, but it is not standard. Uh, so that means that people have to learn it. And not everybody likes to do that. Some people say, I don't want to learn anything new. I want to copy what I know from Maya or Max or another program. And I want Blender to uh, reward that behavior. Right? Mm -hmm. But um, I do alt click for f viewport rotate in Maya. And that has grown on to me, and I want to keep using that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we should. That, that's what 2.8 is meant to do, to make sure that those kind of configurations are advanced and stable and keep working. Yeah. And then the whole discussion about the default is not so interesting anymore. Yeah. But it's more like, okay, what kind, what, which of the defaults are you using? Yeah, I'm using the cookie default. Oh, but I use the Guru default. Way, way, way more fun. Maybe it goes that way. Hmm. But, but one, I okay, know one default is good. Of course, we should have a minimum, uh, the, the minimum configuration. That's what I think. What I like about Maya, for example, if you install it, we did it once, <laughs> to the educational version, and the default key map in Maya is minimal. 
it hardly has anything configured, especially shortcuts. Everything works based on using menus. If you see my tutorials, it's often that you see people click, pa, 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 click, and then they have a tool, do something, click menu, click, 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 click. And that's a bit slow, but it's a, a good mode to learn things. Because you first have to learn how to nav navigate in the software. So where are all the options? Where, where is this? Where is the editing? Where are the vertices in properties? Where are there? Right? And if you reveal that with shortcuts, the other little icons and stuff, then you forget. Because you cannot remember a thousand icons. You can only remember a few. Yeah. So it doesn't work, icons. But those lists and menus, they are quite well to navigate. If you keep them, and then you know, okay, that the file thing, import, everybody knows that you see it once and you can find it again. Edit, uh, view, right? We have a couple of standard concepts. And you know, okay, I want to set the view to camera, the view, oh, camera, ah, right? That's the, the navigation thing they, uh, they present. I think that's what we will try for mm -hmm. the 8 default or the, one of the defaults to make sure that there are maybe 20, 30, 50 shortcuts, that's mm. it. And for the rest, use the manners, use the buttons. The thing that I, I, I'm most like worried about is like uh, that the UI team is made up of power users, right? Like most of them have been using Blender for 10 years or so. And so therefore, uh, it's it's, you know, it's human nature to lean towards what you're most used to. And most Blender users are used to conventions which aren't in any other software. And so I wonder, like, if... But most if Blender users are have Blender users. Oh, no. <laughs> Not so, that old thing. Hey, hello. So a little half of the Blender users use Blender already for more than a year or two or three. Yeah. So yeah, I'm more talking about new people. New yes, users. beginners. Yeah, so I wonder who has the voice of the I beginners. Have a problem. Yeah. So who who has but, the voice of the beginner? But you can't make a beginner uh, who never used 3D software before. You put them in charge of designing interfaces. Yeah, but they know that left click is select. How do they know? They don't know nothing. Because right. Windows, Microsoft, uh, Mac, it's a convention. They click it, but our button it works. A what? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to argue with you with the left or the right click. I'm fine with left click select. So yeah. But I'm not going to give up on the right click. But it's an option, right? You have to give people the option to configure things. And we want to present that. You can say, well, here is the, uh, the, the training wheels blender uh, to get uh, on board and learn things quick. You can use this configuration, the default for new people. And there are a number of configurations for the power users and people who use Blender mm -hmm. already for longer. Yeah. And they want to type and work really fast, and they don't mind having a P that runs a game engine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, probably not. Yeah. So, and how much time, yeah, I mean, the, about the politics in the, in the, in the, in the group of uh, contributors. I mean, there is a level of politics, and that's of course me, right? I'm. Uh, I'm the boss. The head man. Yeah. yeah. I'm the benevolent dictator, <laughs> dictator. for life, the <laughs> FDL. So, because I started this whole thing, and I have a couple of credits on board, uh, still, because I made it happen, and uh, I maintain it, and I prove that I'm not always wrong, right? Uh -huh. I'm often right. I have a good sense of uh, uh, keeping things rock. Yeah, yeah. So, that gives me some credit. And I think it's good for a uh, online community, for people who are involved with Blender, that they know that there's one person who can decide, and who's consistent and relatively predictable, uh, and who's on board for the continuity, and not for making himself more wealthy or what. Right? Because Blender and me, I run, right? This is my life. I, I did this, it's the biggest thing I ever did, and I don't think I will I'll do everything It'll be I your legacy. Bigger. Yeah, mm. that's your so legacy. It's important. So I'm, I'm conservative in that sense. And even though, uh, you say, that politics, if you don't agree with Tom, you got a problem. Yeah, that's true. Right? 
But if you work for Apple and you don't agree with the company, then what do you want, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not too difficult to disagree with me. I'm, I'm, some aspects I'm strong, and I say, well, this is what we keep, have a modality, a cutting blender and small windows and having them pop up with requesters. I had to fight over that forever. Now everybody says this is the right decision. But 15 years ago, it was a discussion topic. Mm -hmm. right? Or the file format, blender is saving blend files and loading it. I mean, you know from other programs that saving and loading, that can take a while, right? The blend files are not as fast. Mm. And, but I had to fight for that, really. So that you can have a one second load of complete project is an important feature. Yeah. But for most software developers, it's not. They want yeah. to have XML, and then you get like Maya files. And then a big project in Maya would take one or two minutes yeah. to open. Yeah. So it's fun, right? Yeah. But for that kind of things, you can discuss that. Yeah. And we had those discussions, very heated, big discussions on changing the file format to make it more accessible for everyone, to make XML, because the whole industry is doing it. And I said no, right? right. So, so that's why it's so fast for Blender. Yeah. And also, but, that, that's my, but I also have a couple of principles. So, so like that Blender should not have an installation. Uh, requirement. So you can still have Blender for Windows on a sticky, mm -hmm. put it in your laptop, or anyone's computer, and you start it and mm -hmm. go run. That's important. Yeah. That means that we, we will not change somebody's computer and that we can keep it local and work and that it works cross platform. There's a lot of benefits for that. Yeah, yeah. And Blender should start within a second. <laughs> yeah. a, Gets a bit slower nowadays, but uh, <laughs> you have to bring it back. It's <laughs> important. What is the software that? should not, you should not wait. Why would you wait for software? Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm amazed at how slow, yeah, a lot of software is to boot. Photoshop. So, yeah, but, so if, but I mean that those kind of politic, political things, mm. if you want to talk to me about making Blender's file format XML, then I'm a bit tired of that. That kind of topics is uh, past, right? We don't go over that. The left mouse and right mouse discussion, uh, we can laugh about that, right? Because I, 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 I like to work with people who say, OK, I can see economical reasons to do this, and I think it's a fast workflow, but it's a bottleneck for new people to come on board. Mm -hmm. What? No, you think that's right? Yeah. No, then we have a deal. Yeah. So how complicated is that? Yeah. But, if, but some people say, ah, oh, this is the most stupid thing on the planet, and you, and, and you are idiots, and uh, yeah, then, then, it, then it doesn't work. Right? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, we talk to each other on a normal level, yeah. and then it doesn't matter if you are a power user or a new user. Mm -hmm. I would also welcome a, a software developer on board who is specialized in UI or usability, uh, working on the Blender mm -hmm. interface. Is there anyone that's been in contact with you? Not enough. Not right? enough yeah. I think for 2.5 we had, uh, for example, Matt App mm -hmm. yeah, from Australia, mm -hmm. uh, William Rannish. They, they were good guys. Yeah. Is Matt Ebb still work with Blender? No, not anymore. He's doing Houdini. Oh, right. Moon, the Lego why. movies, for example. Oh, uh, right, okay. Uh, 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 That's why I haven't and, heard. Uh, but William is uh, sometimes available. I mean, he might come back for, uh, to do things. Yeah. But, uh, but they, he did a good job on 2.5. And I want to uh, to make sure that we have a high quality UI. Yeah. But the others are not sitting still, even though Autodesk uh, is not very innovative. But you get small companies who do new stuff. Right? Certainly, like uh, like uh, the Foundry and uh, New Camodo and others. But you also have uh, algorithmic, substance mm -hmm. painter, substance designer. They're good tools. You use them. Yeah. And they're nice designed, I think. Yeah. They're, they're well done. But not as good as Blender's node groups. Like. No? No. What do you mean? Like uh, in Substance Designer, like uh, if you create this complex, crazy texture sort of system, and then you need to duplicate a part of it, like you want to take this setup with like these 10 nodes. And reuse it. And you want to reuse it, there's no way to link duplicate ah. it. Whereas Blender, you create a, a group. And I'm like, what? And I was talking with one of the other guys that works for us, and he was like, he started using Substance. And he's like, yeah, 
the node groups, it needs node groups like what Blender has. But on the other hand, what, what you can do with substance is brilliant. Yeah, it is. And all procedural, and you make a layer, it's a little bit of a Photoshop interface to, to map things, and then you can create superior textures that look so good. Yeah. And then you bake it, and you export, I mean, that's uh, a workflow. Yeah. But apart from that, I think they did a good job on the UI. Oh, yeah. For, uh, for it. Yeah, it it's really feels good. pleasant, it's modern, it's flat too, that's a provision again. That's true, yeah. yeah. But they do a couple of good shops on previews and uh, the browsing and how they present things. Well done. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of level of design has been it on board. Is when what? You need that kind of design as you uh, can work on right. that level. Yeah. And that's not, yeah, that requires experience. Yeah, it's a hard job. No, so I'm not collecting money for that. And, uh, You're not collecting I'm money. collecting money for that. Uh, oh, to hire a UI that. guy. Well, really? the first question is about how many people are working for the Blender yeah. Institute. So we have currently, as it goes up and down, between eight and 12, I think, uh, depends on what kind of project we do. But not all developers, of course, half of them is artists. But how many people are working on Blender paid as developer via either foundation, because we give out grants, which is my template, or the institute, it's currently eight, I think. That's pretty good. Yeah. And I think it goes back to 10. And it depends, I'm, I, you don't count me then, because I'm not working on Blender. Huh? I'm not doing Emails. <laughs> yeah, email. <laughs> doing interviews. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that's 8 to 10, and that's only growing. Yeah. I'm talking, and there is, from the market, huh, what you said, you notice that things are getting maybe exponential, but it's going up. I also note that when I talk to studios and companies, they are Blender in the picture, and they think, yes, yes, we're going to try. And we are going to support Blender Institute, uh, we want to have some support, or we want to find out how to get Blender more efficiently in our companies. So what the bottleneck here is support and services companies. Mm. Everybody wants me to do that, uh, to do support, but come on. Support services. Support and services. Oh. Like what the Canonical does for Ubuntu or Red Hat for Linux or... That's, uh, a, that's a commercial opportunity for someone, isn't it? Yeah, you can make billions with it. <laughs> Go ahead, please do it. So that, you mean like companies need someone to call on the phone? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, but right. also, hey, uh, we have a character, but uh, the right arm is twitching right. in a specific shot. Fix it. Right. You do that? Make no. Hmm? Oh, if we had a team, yeah, you make money, yeah. Yeah, but you need the people you to organize yeah. that. How, how do you do that? Exactly. It's a special type of work. There was, uh, wasn't Sebastian trying yeah, to... Yeah, they tried. But didn't so. work. Uh, the time is not ready. So it's a, it's a sick and act thing. Because if you would have this company that would have support with a contract, and even when it's not 24 seven for online, but when it's only 10 hours per day on weekdays, still, right? if you can phone or make uh, or have a chat thing, and you can send them priority things to fix, it would work. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it would really work. Yeah. And I even asked a couple of other servicing companies what kind of business model they have behind it, and it's not too complicated. Uh, for example, uh, the character with the arm doing weird, uh, you can have a, a service contract, contract that says that if that you if you cannot solve it, you don't get paid. Ah. It's very fair. That is and fair. That's kind yeah. of an equal thing because you get this thing in, and then you, you said, okay, we look at it. No, we don't do it. Right. We can't fix it. So yeah. Sorry, we can't. We try it, but we can't. No, you don't have to get paid. That's a good and idea. Say, oh, yeah, we can fix it. Will cost you one thousand. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. So that's not bad business, but you need to be commercial for that, and you need to be interested in money. Well, maybe this uh, can talk to the camera and say, "Hey, we got a." <laughs> There's enough people that are starting up yeah. Blender render farms, aren't yeah, there? Uh, yeah. So we don't need they, another render farm. They don't. I don't know why they do. They're nerds. They like computers. <laughs> We need people who like people, people yeah. who like to do business. Support but, companies. But, but you mean. like business. Mm -hmm. you, you have employees. Yeah, but I'm busy with the Polygon. Yeah. <laughs> well, how big is Polygon now? Ten people. Ten? Yeah. Full time. Pretty almost. much. Yeah. yeah. 
Are they all working on their own locations? Yeah, mostly Canada. Yeah. In Canada? Yeah, for some reason. They're all in Vancouver. It's Vancouver? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't planned. Yeah. There's like one in Tennessee and then... So Polygon is getting bigger than Guru. Yeah, it's like uh, more than twice, uh, twice the revenue. Yeah. The Polygon is neutral, right? It is, it's a taxi system for... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's open to 3D's uh, mags, Maya, yeah. But can you see that? In the, can you, did you uh, have questionnaires that people can tell you what kind of we, we should, but we don't. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> we should, but we don't. Uh, I love that. We don't have the user data yet, but... Uh, no no f quick estimate or... We could, I guess we could pull something from the help docs, but it's very rudimentary. We're gonna, so in 2018, we're adding models to the site. So we will have support for 3ds Max, Maya, Octane, all the major renderers and the major software. And so we'll have in, like data then on who downloads what. So that would be the information, but yeah. Good business. But I talk around, you, you, if you ever meet people who say, ah, this done the thing, or what, what can I do for that, or what kind of business is needed? But people who like to organize stuff, especially for support and services, people who know other people. Uh, yeah. You can use the Blender Network for that. It's an open system. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see everybody who is there. They're all available. And there should be an in-between, in, you know, an uh, intermedi intermediate mm -hmm. between the, the customer request and all the professionals out there. Yeah. And then you simply find the right solution for people. Yeah. And if you know, ah, this is a problem, and then that person can fix it, that's worth gold, really. Yeah. Because most people have no idea. Yeah. You but don't even have an idea. I don't have an idea. No. If you have a problem in Blender, you don't know how to fix it. And I go to Twitter. Yeah, you put it on Twitter. <laughs> That's what I use Twitter for. It's a great, it's a great help desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, somebody should make an Uber. You could connect the right artist with the solution. Ask the Uber Blender. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> Million dollar idea. Yeah. So, cool. Well, you've got to shoot off. You've got to go to an agent. Somehow my, my super watch thinks that I'm doing a dynamic workout. <laughs> Maybe you moved your arms too much. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm talking too, uh, too much with energy. Well, good luck with that uh, agent. You agent. got all the uh, info. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. It's exciting. Yeah.